You're listening to the Daily Mishnah Podcast with Benedict. So yesterday we were talking about setting up the loom. And we closed on this picture of the, um, the beam of the loom and setting up two loops to get the warp ready to wind the weft backwards and forwards. And today we're going to get into the preparation of the wool itself. But we will, on the way, see some pictures. And this is a picture, actually, I found in the New York Public Library of, an, of a, well, an artist's visualization of an ancient loom. And you can see that the, the beam that basically drives the whole thing and hangs the cloth is at the top and the warp is hanging from the top and the weft goes backwards and forwards, right to the left. Actually, the reason that I brought you this picture was because underneath is a picture of something called a hatchel. And this thing, um, this thing uh, looks a bit like a comb. Is something that is used for combing flax or wool. And we are going to come across the hatchel in the first Mishnah, which we're going to deal with. Uh, the fourth Mishnah of the chapter, which says, Shiur hamula bain v'hamula peitz v'hat soveya. The measure for the bleacher, a mula ben is a bleacher, someone who makes something white. Hamula peitz, nafatz is to make, um, uh, basically to burst something asunder, to, to spread something apart. But the best translation I found for Munapates, nafats, is the hatchela. It's this person that takes the comb and, if you like, combs apart the threads of the wool. It's some activity to do with preparing wool. And then hatsovea is the dyer and the tove is the spinner. So these are all activities related to preparing wool before it goes on the loom. And in all of these, the Mishnah says that the measure required to make one liable for a sin offering, if one does this on Shabbat, is rochav hasit kaful, a full double sit. And um, it get, the Mishnah goes on to say, ha'oreg shnei chutin, someone who who weaves actually two threads together. So now we're putting the th- we've prepared the threads and we're putting them onto the weft, onto the loom. Shiroki melo hasit, the measure is a full sit. So we've got a double sit and a sit. And the question I think you're going to be asking is, what is a sit? And I wanted to bring you this. The sit is actually discussed in Orla. Unfortunately, in one of the Mishnayot in Orla that fell in the Ben Hasmanim. But there's a nice picture, actually, that Steinsaltz brings in his Gemara of the sit and the double sit. According to Rashi, anyway, the Rambam has a different view. For the Rambam, these are much wider measures. A, a sit is two hands breadths, and a double sit is four hands breadths. But for Rashi, and as far as I can see for mainstream commentators, a sit is the space between two, say, two fingers, say your first finger and your second finger. And a double sit is the space between your thumb and your first finger. So you can see these are pictured out here. The, the double sit is on, on the right and the sit is on the left. So these are the two measures for the, for the quantity of thread that we weave in to make the critical mass on Shabbat or for the quantity of wool which the bleacher or the hatchler and the dyer and the spinner is going to spin on Shabbat to, again to reach critical mass. Now, the Mishnah is then going to go, is going to segue from preparing cloth to hunting animals. And it's, it's very interesting. Hunting animals in the taxonomy that we learned in chapter 7 is part of the sequence leading up to writing. But here, it seems to be part of making clothes. And Rabbi Yudas says, 
Hatsad sipur la migdal utzfi la bayt chayav. Someone who hunts a bird into a tower or a deer into a house is liable. This tower seems to be some kind of wooden trap, more like a closet, perhaps, in American English. I mean, I've translated here as migdal because the Hebrew word migdal means a tower. But this is, seems to be some kind of small box where once you've trapped, once you've chased a bird into it, you are uh, essentially, the bird can't get out and you can just reach in and grab the bird. And hunting is an avmalacha. Hunting is one of the 39 archetypal acts of creation on Shabbat, even though we're not creating anything. And we should emphasize here that when the Mishnah says Hatsad, someone who hunts, it is not talking about slaughter. Shechita, killing an animal or wounding an animal is a completely different malacha, which we'll come on to later. We're talking here about hunting in the language of the Mishnah is essentially trapping an animal. And it means trapping an animal to the point that, well, essentially we can, the way the Bartonura expresses it is that we can get it with one, we can bend over and grab it. That's essentially his language. We can bend over with one bend and grab it. And so the sages add, Tzipur amigdal, uh, that's the case if you chase a bird into a tower. Utsfi la bait vila chatser vila vila bevarium. And the sages say a bird into a tower and a deer into a house or a courtyard or a bevarium. Bevarium, it, you can feel it's a Latin word, right? In the, or, sorry, bevarin. Bevarin in the Mishnah, you can feel it's a Latin word. And literally, we translate that as vivarium. It's some kind of place where you keep live animals. And Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel is going to He's going to disagree slightly. He seems to agree with the principle, but he says, Lo kol habevarin, not every vivarium is the same. Zehaklal, this is the principle. Muhusar tzeda, if it must still be hunted, still needs a bit of hunting. Patur, in other words, this vivarium is large enough that you've chased in the deer, but you can't reach over with one hand and grab the deer. The vivarium is large enough that you'd need to go into the, you'd need to go in there and run around and catch it. If it needs that amount of hunting, you're not you, you're not obliged to bring a sin offering. And then if it doesn't need any more hunting, chayav. If it no longer needs to be hunted, then he's liable. Finally, the mission is going to close with a question as to what happens if two people are involved in the hunting. And we're going to go back, actually, to the principle that we learned right in the first Mishnah of the first chapter, where the poor man stood outside and the householder stood inside. And we learned that if the poor man carries from out to in, or the householder carries from in to out, they're liable. But if they share the action, if they perform the action jointly, maybe the poor man stretches his hand in and the householder puts something into it and then the poor man takes his hand out. So both of them are needed to complete the action. In that case, neither of them is liable for a sin offering, for a chatat. And the four, the, the, this mission is going to follow exactly the same principle. Someone, a deer entered a house, and someone locked it. Chayav, he's liable. If two people locked it, so somehow two people are involved in locking it, maybe, they, how would they do this? Maybe, um, how would they both lock it? That's a really interesting question which we need to think about. Carrying like a big board and locking the door together. Yeah, well, well, maybe, may, yeah, exactly. So maybe they carry a big, yeah, maybe they carry a big bolt or something. Maybe they carry a big bolt and they lock it together. Or maybe one person puts the key in the lock and another one turns it. For, in some way, they carry out the action together. Put her in there. 
they're, they're, they're free. But, and of course, this is the same principle that we learned in carrying large objects on Shabbat. Remember, we learned that, again, if two people carry an object that is large enough, for, if two people carry an object in general, they're puturim. There's an exception there for an object which is so large that it needs both of them to carry. And along the same lines, the Mishnah is going to explain, lo linol. If one of them could not shut it, so maybe the bolt is so giant that it can't be carried by one person. And then, so they both carry the bolt. But this is a bolt that can only be carried by two. They're both liable in that case. Rabbi Shimon Poter, Rabbi Shimon is going to exempt them and the Halakha does not follow Rabbi Shimon. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Daily Mishnah Podcast with Benedict.